From 235 to 284 AD, Rome was plagued by nearly 50 years of civil war, barbarian invasions, inflation, and pestilence. These harrowing decades, known as the Crisis of the 3rd Century, would see more than 20 emperors assassinated by their own troops, killed on the battlefield, succumb to plague, or, in the unfortunate case of Valerian, taken prisoner. Perennial barbarian invasions from Germanic tribes along the Rhine and Danube would reach deep into Roman territory. And if that weren't enough, the resurgent Persian Empire, under the Sasanian dynasty, was eager to reconquer its lost territories in the east. By 271 AD, the empire would be shattered into three pieces. Yet Rome would emerge from this crucible victorious, reunited by rough-hewn military dictators from the outer provinces with grandiloquent titles such as Restorer of the World. In this series, we'll be taking a brief, condensed look at this period and attempt to form an understanding of the geographic dimensions of this chaotic epoch. The crisis of the 3rd century is generally accepted to have begun with the assassination of Severus Alexander in 235 AD. Fresh off the heels of a Pyrrhic expedition against the Persians, Alexander made camp at Mines along the Rhine River in 234 and countered an incursion made by the Germanic Alamanni tribe. Rather than pushing his advantage against the invaders, this even-tempered but ultimately timid young emperor offered payment to the Germans to prevent further encroaches. His troops, many of whom were from the frontier areas affected by the invasion, were, in the words of Herodian, forced to accept the double tragedy of hardship during the Persian campaign and then the destruction of their homeland. Denied their chance at revenge and deprived of an opportunity to subsidize their salary with war loot, Alexander's soldiers rose up and killed the 26-year-old emperor, raising one of their own to the purple. The army's choice was Maximinus Thrax, a towering Thracian of barbarian stock who had worked his way up through the common soldiery. Appointed by Alexander to train new recruits, this former shepherd harbored no aristocratic conceit and was willing to train his men one-on-one -on -one and share in their burdens, earning their admiration and personal loyalty. Though viewed with derision for his low birth, the Senate confirmed Maximinus with Imperium, and the new Augustus launched a campaign deep into Alamanni territory, personally rushing into a swamp ahead of his army and cutting down the Germans who had fled there. With his enemies cowed and his army's bloodlust sated, Maximinus moved into Pannonia in 236, where he successfully fought off an incursion by the Sarmatians and Dasai. While he was successful in defending the empire's restive northern border and rebuilding neglected infrastructure, the tax burden for these projects proved irksome to both elites and the general public. Private property confiscation was rife, public funds were drawn down, and Herodian salaciously alleges that he sent statues of the gods to be melted into coins to pay his soldiers. The breaking point came in 235 AD, when wealthy youths in Carthage assassinated a Maximinus allied tax collector who was seeking to rob them of their inheritances. Needing a leader for their insurrection, these young men confronted the governor of Africa, a well-respected 80-year-old proconsul known as Gordian I, and with swords drawn they offered to either hail him as Augustus or slay him if he refused. Gordian reluctantly accepted the honors, taking his son Gordian II as his co-ruler, Sparing no time, the rebel emperor sent a mission to Rome, under false pretenses, and had Maximinus's praetorian prefect Vitellianus assassinated. When news spread, the city erupted into riotous mob violence, as Romans hunted down Maximinus's officials, dragging them through the streets and throwing them into the sewers. The senate quickly confirmed Gordian and his son as Augustus, and sent emissaries to the provincial governors, enjoining them to resist Maximinus. Awkwardly, the senate would soon be left leaderless. The governor of nearby Numidia was a Maximinus loyalist known as Capellianus, and when he had heard of the plot to overthrow his benefactor, he gathered up his own troops and headed for Carthage. The younger Gordian hastily raised a militia and met Capellianus in battle just outside the city. However, he was handily defeated by the experienced Numidian soldiers and slain on the battlefield alongside his troops. Gordian I, despairing the death of his son and his own impending capture, took his life. He had reigned for only 22 days. With Gordian dead and Maximinus on his way with the empire's most battle-hardened troops, the Senate met in the Temple of Jupiter and elected 20 elder statesmen from their own ranks. This body would select two co-emperors, Pupianus, and yes, that's actually how you pronounce his name, and Balbinus. Their election sparked civil unrest, however, as Pupianus was not well remembered by the people of Rome during his strict tenure as prefect of the city. To mollify the crowds, they selected Gordian's young grandson, Gordian III, to serve as Caesar, a junior partner and acknowledged successor to the two Augusti. With the citizens tentatively on his side, Pupianus went north to raise an army while Balbinus stayed in Rome to govern the city. 
Meanwhile, Maximinus had been marching west from Pannonia, and as he closed on Italy, he found the countryside abandoned until he was stopped at the city of Aquileia, which had been hurriedly fortified by its obstinate citizens. Refusing all offers of peace from Maximinus, the city militia bravely stood at the walls, day and night, fighting the experienced Danube legions. Having denuded the countryside of supplies, the besieged were now able to outlast the besiegers, and hunger was rife amongst Maximinus's army. Demoralized by the stout resistance of the Aquilean militia, mounting famine, and harsh discipline, a contingent of Maximinus's soldiers mutinied and killed the man they had raised to the purple just three years earlier. Upon hearing the news, Pupianus went to Aquileia and ordered Maximinus's defeated army back to their garrisons, returning to Rome with only a contingent of German auxiliaries that were personally loyal to him. Meeting Balbinus and Gordian III outside the city, the trio were met with public acclaim as Rome celebrated the death of the quote-unquote tyrant Maximinus. All was not well, however, and Pupianus's German bodyguard roused suspicious amongst the Praetorians, who were, after all their treachery, paranoid of being supplanted. A plot was hatched, and while the public was distracted by a festival, the Praetorians attacked the imperial palace. Herodian states that the two Augusti were involved in a heated argument when they were apprehended, with Balbinus countermanding the order to summon the protection of the German auxiliaries, thinking Pupianus was plotting to overthrow him and take sole rule of the empire. Regardless, these elder statesmen were arrested and unceremoniously dragged into the Praetorian camp and killed. Gordian III, all of 13 years old, would be proclaimed Augustus by the guard, having become the sole survivor of what would be called the Year of the Six Emperors. Needless to say, young Gordian inherited a troubled realm. Aside from the recent civil war, the Gauls had invaded across the Danube and attacked the town of Histria in Lower Moesia, and the Carpi broke through further west. More troublingly, when the Romans were busy fighting amongst themselves, the Sasanian king Ardashir had swept into the province of Mesopotamia, taking the town of Nisbus and Kerry sometime in the mid to late 230s. Foreign enemies weren't the only threats to the empire, however, and in 240, the governor of Numidia, a man named Sabinianus, made an attempt to revolt and had to be put down with troops from Mauritania. Luckily for the boy emperor, he would receive a competent regent in the form of Timosithius. This able soldier and administrator had risen through the ranks to become Praetorian prefect in 241 and would practically run the empire for Gordian. After being married to Timosithius' daughter, Gordian and his now father-in-law headed east to Syria, where the rampaging Persians had sacked the allied city-state of Hatra. The capable Timosithius defeated Shapur, son of Ardashir and newly made king of Persia, at the Battle of Rasena in 243 and recovered Mesopotamia. Riding high on victory, he planned to march along the Euphrates to the Persian capital of Tesaphon. However, this great general would never live to see the gates of that city, and died of dysentery. He was succeeded by his deputy, Philip, who proceeded with the plan to attack Tesaphon. Sources contradict what happened next, with the Byzantine chronicler Zosimus and um, the colorfully written Historia Augusta stating that Philip sabotaged the army's rations in order to provoke a mutiny against the teenage emperor, resulting in his assassination. The Persian sources, however, state that Gordian was killed in the Battle of Messitia, just outside of Tesaphon in modern-day Fallujah, in 244, at age 19. Regardless of whether the new Praetorian prefect had conspired against young Gordian, Marcus Julius Verus Philippus, known to us as Philip the Arab, was hailed as emperor by the troops. Perhaps taking a lesson from Maximinus, Philip made a hasty trip to Rome and sent word to the Senate that young Gordian had died of natural causes. In order to quickly extricate himself from his eastern campaign, he signed a less than favorable peace with the Persians, keeping Roman gains in Mesopotamia, but paying Shapur an indemnity. Unlike Maximinus, Philip proved quite popular with the Senate and seemed to be an able leader at first, winning decisive victories against the Quadi and Carpi in 246 and 247, before returning to Rome in 248 to host the celebrations of the 1,000th anniversary of the city. Philip's luck dried out after this high point in his reign. Perhaps feeling confident after his victories over the Carpi and Quadi, he ceased paying subsidies to the Goths, who invaded and besieged the city of Marcianopolis in 249. While chaos reigned below the Danube, the commander in charge of Pannonia and Moesia, a Pacatianus, revolted and declared himself Augustus with the support of his legions. Another usurper in the east named Jatopianus also made a bid for the throne. With the situation spinning out of control, a distraught Philip offered his resignation to the Senate. His offer was rejected, though, with the former city prefect Gaius Decius consoling the emperor and arguing that these rebellions would be easily crushed. 
His nerves calmed, Philip sent Decius to deal with Pacatianus. Decius's prediction was proven correct. Both usurpers were killed by their own troops, and the former prefect arrived to restore order along the chaotic frontier, proving himself a capable leader. However, in case you didn't see this coming, the troublesome Danube legions then declared Decius emperor, allegedly against his own protestations. This quote-unquote reluctant usurper sent word to Rome that he had no designs on the throne, but Philip was unpersuaded by his former subordinate and marched north to meet the rebel army with his own troops. The two would come to blows at Verona, where Philip was killed in action, his army routed by the battle-hardened frontier troops brought by Decius. Now uncontested, the new Augustus made his way to Rome, where he was hailed as emperor and confirmed by the Senate with all due honors. He would have little time to savor his victory, however, and in 250 he headed east once more to repel a new invasion by a coalition of Carpi and Gauls. Once reaching the border, Decius easily expelled the Carpi, earning himself the title Restitutor Daciarum, or Restorer of Dacia. His fight against the Gauls would prove to be more difficult, however. Their leader, Caniva, led a two-pronged invasion across the Danube, taking 70,000 men to attack the town of Novi, while sending another 20,000 into eastern Moesia, which was virtually undefended. While the eastern column ravaged the countryside all the way to Philippopolis, Caniva and his men were defeated by the then governor of Moesia, Trebonianus Gallus, who we'll be hearing more about shortly. Undeterred, Caniva pushed through the interior and besieged the town of Nicopolis. Decius himself arrived shortly after, breaking the siege and forcing Caniva even further south. However, while pursuing the Gothic invaders, Caniva caught Decius in an ambush near the town of Baroe and decisively defeated the imperial army. Unable to confront the Goths with his shattered legions, the emperor made his way back to the frontier, where he met up with Trebonianus Gallus and his border troops, determined to piece together another army and defeat Caniva. Meanwhile, the Gauls continued their rampage and converged near Philippopolis, sacking the city in the summer of 251. Perhaps having had their share of plunder, the barbarians began heading north, only to be intercepted by Decius and his new army near the town of Abritus. The ensuing Battle of Abritus would be one of the worst defeats in Roman history. Though he initially had the upper hand and defeated two of Caniva's three divisions, Decius made the mistake of following the retreating enemy into a swamp where his army was ambushed by the waiting Goths. Trapped in the marshes of Abritus, Decius was killed in the mud alongside his men under a hail of Gothic missiles, the first emperor to be killed by a foreign foe. Leaderless and on the verge of total defeat, the tattered remnants of the Moesian legions proclaimed Trebonianus Gallus as emperor. Unable to militarily resist Caniva with his broken army, Gallus was forced to make an unfavorable peace treaty with the Goths allowing them to return home with their spoils and promising annual subsidies. With the Germanic invaders at least temporarily mollified, the new Augustus quickly headed back to Rome, where he would be confirmed by the Senate. Gallus would reign for a stormy two years, first beset by the devastating Cyprian plague, and then by a renewed Persian offensive in the east. In 252 or 253, King Shapur took over Armenia and then annihilated a force of 60,000 Romans at the Battle of Barbalisos. If Shapur's own inscriptions are to be believed, the Persians then conquered 36 cities in Syria and Cappadocia, including Antioch, the empire's third largest metro area. If that weren't enough, the same year bands of quote-unquote Scythians, we don't know their real identity, sailed from the Black Sea through the Bosphorus and raided Asia Minor, burning the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Surprisingly, the restive Danube frontier was the one bright spot in all this chaos, with the governor of Moesia, one Marcus Aemilius Aemilianus, ending tribute to the Goths and launching a successful invasion of their territory in 253. Heartened by this victory, the Danube legions hailed their general as emperor, and Aemilian began his march on Rome. When alerted to the threat of this usurper, Gallus requested help from the commander of the Rhine legions, a general named Valerian, who duly began marching south with his own battle-hardened frontier troops. But it was too late. Sources differ on what happened next, but Gallus was assassinated by his own men, either before or after a battle with Aemilian near the modern city of Terni. The Senate was once again placed in the awkward position of having to invest Imperium in a man they had so recently declared a public enemy. However, this state of affairs would be short-lived. Valerian did not return to the Rhine after hearing of Gallus's death, but continued to march on Rome, his own men having declared him emperor along the way. Aemilian moved north to meet him in battle, but never got past the city of Spoletium. 
Valerian's army, recently reinforced to fight the Alamanni, would be a formidable opponent, and perhaps recognizing their poor prospects, Emilian's troops assassinated him before meeting the enemy in battle. He had only reigned for two months. Valerian would complete his march on Rome and have his son Gallienus, who we'll be hearing much about later, appointed as co-emperor. The two would split up and play whack-a-mole along the frontiers, battling both Germanic invaders and the Persians until Valerian's own tragic capture in 260. However, this episode is run way too long as it is, so we'll pick up on Valerian's reign next time. As always, thank you for watching, and please post any corrections in the comments below.